Welcome to Episode 8 of Wraiths of the Appalachian, Spirits from the Past. In this episode, we accompany Eddie and Snarly Yow to Hopkinsville, Kentucky, home to some very interesting paranormal and unexplained phenomena. As if Eddie hasn't already had his fair share. Let's jump in and begin, shall we? Chapter 8 Spirits of the Past Eddie sat in the parking lot of the combination gas station, convenience store, and laundromat in Clarksville, staring at Renee's number on his cell phone. The rumble of the VW's engine nearly drowned out the sound of the local morning DJ on the radio as Snarly Owl waited patiently on the floorboard behind the front seats. The quality inn where he had spent the night after his exhausting and terrifying ordeal was only a dozen miles from the Bell Witch Farm, but far enough away to be clear of those ghosts and goblins. Since Eddie was finally confident that Snarly was invisible to most living souls, he'd brought his companion into the motel where the wolf dog had enjoyed a double bed all to himself and warm food Eddie brought back from the breakfast bar. After a few hours of much-needed sleep, Eddie found the laundromat where he cleaned his muddy clothes in preparation for the next leg of their journey. He pushed his phone into his jeans pocket and reached back to scratch Snarly's jaw. Where to now? That was the most pressing of several questions. In the cave, Eddie feared that something had happened to Rene and his mother since their spirits were among the visions that came to torture him. But once out in the light of day, he convinced himself that what he had seen was either a figment of his panicked mind or an illusion caused by a twisted spirit pretending to be the two most important women in his life. I could do without another night like last night. How about you, fella? Eddie rubbed the hound's face as he remembered the blood that had been glistening there 24 hours previous. Where did you run off to, anyway? The radio crackled and Mr. D's voice greeted them. Good morning. I trust you both are well and rested. What the hell, D? Did you know what kind of crazy ghosts would be in that cave? I thought I was going to have a heart attack or lose my mind. Why did you put me in such a place? You chose to go to the cave. Like that wasn't part of the plan? Give me a break. To be completely accurate, there was just one spirit in the cave. And maybe another one outside? Eddie shook his head in exasperation. A movement to his left caught his eye, and he saw a woman holding her newly purchased coffee standing by the driver's door of her car, frowning as she studied him. Eddie gave her a nod and a weak smile. She broke eye contact and quickly got in her car. Eddie watched her back up and pull out of the parking lot before speaking again. So what was up with those visions of my mother and Renee? Are they alive? Are they safe? If I wasn't seeing their ghosts, what were those? Why ask me? Why didn't you call them yourself? Eddie did not respond, but looked at Snarly Yow as he stroked the wolf dog's ears. They're both well. Your mother is used to not hearing from you. Your girlfriend is demonstrating remarkable patience, wouldn't you say? Eddie remained silent, his gaze focused on the dog. After a few moments of silence, Eddie spoke softly as he continued to pet Snarly. I don't know what to say to either of them. Perhaps a bit more soul-searching, then. Shall we travel on? I'm not sure if I can stand another night like what happened in the cave. Eddie's throat was so tight he could barely speak. It is quite natural to be afraid. Fear keeps you alive, but it must be held in check. There is but one remedy to cure a crippling fear. You must face it. Is that what this trip is about? Me facing my fears? Mr. D did not answer. So where to next? We crossed the state line into Kentucky, Hopkinsville, but our destination is less than an hour's drive from here. Ah, that's good. I'm still pretty worn out, so a day to recuperate will be good, as long as there is a chance to recuperate. When no answer came, Eddie put the van in gear. Feel free to direct me to wherever I'm supposed to go, he said. Just take a right out of the parking lot and I'll tell you where to turn. We'll be taking I-169 into Hopkinsville. 
and you can park anywhere downtown. I shouldn't look for a campground first? Let's just see what happens in town. In 45 minutes, Eddie found himself parked on 9th Street on the edge of the downtown area of the small Kentucky town. Snarly lay curled up on the floorboard behind the van's front seats and showed no inclination to want to change his situation. Might be best if I check out the town by myself anyway, Eddie said as he stroked the wolf dog's head. He looked at the roiling clouds in the gray sky with a frown and grabbed his jacket from the back seat. Pausing for a second as he looked at the resting dog, he shrugged and reached across to roll the passenger window down an inch or two, and then did the same for his own window before getting out and locking the van up. Maybe phantom dogs don't need fresh air, but who knows. Most of the brick businesses on the main street of Hopkinsville were just a story or two high. Eddie could get a pretty good view of the whole town just by looking down the main avenue and thought walking 9th Street was as good a plan as any. When he'd walked nearly a block, he heard the faint strains of a familiar song. Reggae? In rural Kentucky? As Eddie continued to walk, it became clear that the music was coming from inside the movie theater across the street. Eddie jaywalked to approach the theater and found that the first set of double doors, all six of which were painted fire engine red with old-fashioned porthole windows, was unlocked. He walked into a lobby that appeared to have been forgotten from another decade. No one was working the counter, which was bare of concessions, but the smell of old popcorn still hung in the air. As there was no one to ask about admission, Eddie walked on through the black doors leading into the darkened auditorium, where he realized that the music came from a band playing Bob Marley's classic Get Up, Stand Up in what appeared to be vintage concert footage, possibly even a home movie from which much of the color had faded. The hair on Eddie's neck stood up as he noticed that the band wasn't the Wailers, but a tribute band that did an excellent job of sounding like them playing lead guitar was Jeff Bowen, Eddie's father. Eddie had never seen movie footage of his father's band playing, had never even heard that such existed. He stood transfixed, watching in the aisle of the theater as tears formed in his eyes. His father was incredibly charismatic and had a natural talent for mimicry, so he was extremely popular as a frontman to portray black rock stars from the 60s and 70s, like Jimi Hendrix or Bob Marley, depending on the venue that hired him. Eddie remembered, though, how his father had resented that concert promoters would not hire him to play his own music. For that reason, Jeff Bowen preferred the smaller gigs where he could be himself, rather than shows like the one Eddie observed on the screen. As the song ended, the camera zoomed in on the lead singer who smiled and looked straight into the viewer's eyes. He flashed a peace sign and said, I love you, son. A bright light flashed and the film began to dissolve, bubbling and burning away from the center until nothing remained but a white light shining on the screen and the sound of an empty reel turning. Eddie looked around the empty theater and tried in vain to see if he could make out a figure in the projection booth. He pushed back through the door into the lobby where still no one was present. Hello? Is anybody there? He searched the perimeter of the lobby and found a door that likely led to an office, but it was locked. He saw steps that he knew would take him to the projection booth, and he took them two at a time, desperate to find someone who could tell him about this mysterious movie. The door to the booth was unlocked but when Eddie entered, he saw no one manning the antiquated projector which still continued to turn its big reel while shining a solid beam of light into the auditorium. Eddie called out again, but no one answered. He slowly walked out of the booth and down the steps into the lobby, giving one last look around the lobby for an employee before finally stepping out onto the street. A light drizzle fell, but Eddie wasn't ready to return to the van yet. He continued to head west on 9th Street, and in another block or so he came to a white building with Greek columns that looked like a grand old post office. Eddie climbed the steps leading to the entrance where he saw a sign identifying it as the Penny Royal Museum. When he tried to enter, he found the door securely locked. The rain began to come down in sheets as Eddie walked the length of the portico, peering into several of the tall windows that lined the front of the building in hopes of finding an employee. There were a number of exhibits that looked routine, 
displays of sepia photographs of early settlers, carvings by local artists, and informative boards about the history of tobacco in Hopkinsville. But some begged a bit more attention. Two large black and white portraits of a bespectacled man and a woman, one might presume to be his wife, both made in the first half of the 20th century, were backlit with neon light that changed colors every few seconds. The glowing lighting for these large photos would have seemed oddly out of place in such a traditional museum had it not been for a cut-out figure of what looked like an alien or a gremlin that stood prominently in a nearby corner. A little something for everyone here in Hopkinsville, I guess, Eddie thought. Failing to see anyone inside who might help him, Eddie turned back to the street to see where else he might go to get out of the rain. A diner just a few doors down and across the street seemed as good a place as any, so Eddie turned the collar up on his jacket and made his way to the sidewalk, being mindful not to fall on the slick steps. I'm sorry, but all our tables are full. A pleasant, middle-aged waitress with hair that was obviously dyed black and wearing a pale blue t-shirt with a winged Big Fellas logo smiled apologetically at Eddie, who stood dripping just within the entrance. I guess the rain drove everybody in early. We're usually not this crowded yet. You can have my table, said a pleasant African-American man who appeared to be in his sixties, if you'd let me stay long enough to finish just one more cup of coffee. He smiled at Eddie and gestured for him to sit. Eddie gratefully slid into the seat across from him after removing his soaked jacket and hanging it on the back of his chair. Thank you, Rachel, the gentleman said to the waitress as she filled his cup. I'll get you a menu, she said to Eddie. I highly recommend the fried catfish sandwich, the man said with a friendly smile. Oh, uh, sure, that sounds good, Eddie said to the waitress. That with some fries would be great. And that coffee smells good, too. Rachel smiled and said, I'll be right back with your food. Eddie smiled awkwardly at the man seated across from him, who peered at him over the rim of his coffee cup. He had closely cropped gray hair and wore a dark sport coat over a white button-down shirt with crisply ironed khaki slacks. Rachel's great, Eddie's host said when the waitress was out of earshot. Been working here as long as I can remember. Good to know, Eddie responded. And thanks for the seat. And the lunch recommendation. The man grinned. Purely selfish on my part. I couldn't have enjoyed my coffee if I had to sit here and watch you standing there dripping all over the place. He offered his hand across the table. Jake Warren. I do a little real estate business around here. Eddie Bowen. Nice to meet you. I, uh, well, I'm just passing through. And thanks again. I would have waited out the storm in the museum across the street, but it was locked. Oh, the Penny Royal. Yeah, I think they're still doing some renovations. Eddie nodded, not really knowing what else to say. I'm guessing that you weren't there to see the grand history of tobacco growing in Christian County. You look more like one of the Edgar Casey types to me. Eddie smiled with a puzzled look. Excuse me? Edgar Casey? The Sleeping Prophet? Eddie shook his head. He was a famous clairvoyant who was born near here and lived in Hopkinsville in his youth. They said he could memorize the contents of a book just by laying it under his head while he slept. He became famous for his readings, which were said to provide miraculous healings. Well, I guess that explains the glowing portraits I saw through the window, Eddie said. Jake nodded. It does look like they've got some unusual displays for a small town museum, Eddie continued. Like the little alien dude? Oh, that's our claim to fame, Jake said. Next to Edgar Casey, that is. The Kentucky Goblins. Little green men who allegedly attacked a family on a farm near here one night back in 1955. Only they weren't green. The reporters just said that afterward and it stuck. Must have been a big deal for the town to make a museum exhibit about it. Jake shrugged. Whatever brings in the customers. They've got a great exhibit about the black folks who lived in this area. Wonderful photographs. I'm proud of them for doing that. But most folks are more interested in the display about the attack of the black birds that happened here in the 70s. And can't really blame them for that because it was so strange. Fifty million birds came here to roost. They destroyed entire crops and their droppings caused fungus infections. It was a mess. Psychics, aliens, and killer birds? This sounds like one crazy little town. 
It's an interesting place, all right, Jake agreed. He took another sip of his coffee and then asked, So you here for a while? No, I was just doing a little sightseeing, actually. Probably just the night. But I do have a question about the movie theater down the street. The Princess? Jake asked. Yeah, that's one of the properties I manage. What about it? The waitress set a cup of coffee in front of Eddie and said, Your sandwich will be right out. Eddie thanked her and poured two packets of sugar and a small plastic cup of artificial creamer into a steaming drink as he stalled, wondering how much to say about his experience in the theater. Do they show old movies there? They haven't shown movies in The Princess since the 70s, Jake said. The Alhambra is the only theater in town now for that. For a while, The Princess was a lounge, had bands every now and then, and a drag show which is pretty strange for this little town, I always thought, considering how conservative it is. But it's been sitting dormant for quite a while. Why? Eddie hesitated and then decided to tell what happened. I heard music coming from inside, and when I went in, there was nobody there. But there was a movie playing. Jake looked puzzled. That's really strange. I've been in there lots of times, and there's no way anybody could show movies now. The screen's gone, and the whole place doesn't even look like a theater inside anymore. Eddie was relieved when Rachel arrived with his sandwich. Can I get you some more coffee, Jake? she asked. You mind if I sit with you for another cup? he asked Eddie. No, please, stay as long as you'd like. As Eddie poured ketchup into a puddle for his fries, Jake said, If you don't mind my asking, is it safe to assume you're not here on business? You don't exactly look like the businessman type. Although none of that is my business, Jake chuckled at himself. Not a problem at all, Eddie said as he popped a french fry into his mouth. He found himself really warming up to the older man. I'm on a bit of a road trip, just kind of clearing my head a bit. Thought I'd see some of the country that's off the beaten path. Nice, Jake answered as he set his coffee cup down. Everybody ought to do that at some point before they get tied down to jobs, mortgages, and responsibilities. Eddie nodded as he took a big bite of his sandwich. Oh, man, this is really good. It's the house specialty. They've got it seasoned just right. Nothing like a good catfish sandwich if it's done right. Jake took another sip of coffee and let Eddie eat in silence for a moment before he spoke again. You really remind me of my son, he said finally. Does he live here in Hopkinsville, too? Eddie asked around another mouthful. No, he died a number of years ago, when he was 14. Eddie put a sandwich down and wiped his mouth. Oh, I'm so sorry. Jake waved his hand in dismissal. I didn't mean to make you feel strange. Shouldn't have even mentioned it. It's that your mannerisms, even how you look, well, it just brings back his memory. My wife always said offspring from mixed marriages always make the prettiest babies. Eddie looked down at his plate awkwardly. No, no, Jake said. Now I'm the one who's sorry. My wife always said I never knew when to keep my mouth shut. No problem, Eddie said. My mother says the same thing. But her family never got over her marrying my father. Jake nodded. Eddie was silent for a moment, but then feeling something of a kindred spirit in the man across the table, added softly, I lost my dad when I was fourteen. Is that right? Jake said it as more of an affirmation than a question. Eddie nodded. They sat in thoughtful silence for a moment as Eddie finished his meal and Jake sipped his coffee. After Eddie had swiped his plate with his last french fry, he asked Jake a question as he focused on the task of wiping the salt from his fingers. That movie that was playing in the Princess Theater? Yes. Eddie dropped the napkin on his plate, then propped his elbows on either side of it and laced his fingers, propping his chin on his coupled hands. He looked Jake directly in the eye. It was a movie of my dad playing with his band. Jake looked back just as intently and nodded. When he didn't react as if Eddie were crazy, Eddie continued. I've been feeling like he's, well, like he's close lately. Maybe he is, son. Maybe he is. Eddie felt like he was close to tears again, so he motioned for the waitress to bring his check. Let me get that, will you, Eddie? Oh, I... 
it would be a favor to me. This was kind of like having lunch with my son. He put his credit card on the table for Rachel and said when she arrived, I'm going to take care of both of these. She smiled and said, I'll be right back. That rain has not let up one bit, Jake said. Did you park nearby? My van's up at the other end of 9th Street, up towards the county building. You'll be soaked through and through by the time you get there. Let me give you a lift. My car's right outside. He pointed through the picture window to a black 1990 Mercedes that was parked right in front of the diner. Eddie nodded, and after Jake had settled his bill, they made the short dash to Jake's car. Nice car, Eddie said. You've kept it up well. My dad always said you could trust a man who maintained his car right. Well, it's not all that old, Jake said, but I agree with your father. As they approached the parking lot where the van was parked, Jake asked, So are you staying in town tonight? I mostly camp. Hopefully this storm will blow over before long. Jake pulled into the empty space beside the van and put his car in park. He looked at Eddie for a moment, with the only sound being the rain beating down on the car and the steady rhythm of the windshield wipers. He pulled a small notebook from his jacket pocket, wrote something on a page in it, tore it out of the book, and handed it to Eddie. I've got a little place just a couple of miles from here, a cabin that nobody's using. That's the address. I reckon you can find it. I keep a key under the little bear statue that's on the porch. Why don't you use it tonight? Oh, no, you don't have to do that. I don't want to put you out any. It wouldn't be putting me out at all. It's just a little vacation place we rent out sometimes. No problem at all. He wiped his eyes and then looked at Eddie. It'd make me feel good. Eddie sensed that there was more to Jake's offer than just a kind act from a stranger. Somehow he knew, too, that it had something to do with Jake's son. Okay, I'll do that. And thanks for everything. Jake nodded. Eddie got out of the Mercedes, ran around to the driver's side of the van, and climbed in. Snarly Al raised his head from where he'd been napping, curious but totally unalarmed. Jake backed out of the parking place and headed his car back onto 9th Street again. Before he pulled out onto the street, he waved at Eddie, and Eddie waved back. And then he was gone. That concludes Episode 8, Dark Friends, but not Eddie's adventure in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Again, I'd like to point out that the places mentioned in this episode, the Penny Royal Museum and Big Fella's Diner, are real. Road trip, anyone? You might want to listen to Episode 9 before making a commitment. On the other hand, surely what happens to Eddie wouldn't happen to you, would it? Don't forget that you can stream all kinds of beautiful, eerie music created by Mambi Yulman on mambiyulman.bandcamp.com. And you can find more tips, scary links, and dark humor by joining us at the Dark Corners Facebook group. Okay, see you next time in the Dark Corners. <laughs>